Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, your source for all things NASCAR history. Presented by QWare. Maintain excellence. Oh, boy. <laughs> it's hard to say. I mean, it's chilled up here, you, you know. The day NASCAR and all of us associated in any way with NASCAR forget its past, that's the day we don't have any future. Well, in 92, you became Mark, you are Mark Cucci. Yes. What was your relationship with him? Well, as I said, I, I admired what he did as early as, what, 82 at yeah. Nashville? Yeah. And then I saw him, maybe it was 81 at Nashville, 82, he went out on his own, and I saw how it just broke his heart, because everybody used him up. Nobody built him the right kind of cars. They came to Daytona with a, the body was put on it at the wrong frame heights. They had to run it six inches off the ground. It was just a mess. Finally went broke, you know, yeah. tried to do things. Uh, drove the four car. G.C. Spencer said he would never make a race car driver, he, you know. And he was just nervous and jerky, but he did go back home and actually went to Milwaukee with a wife and three kids and worked his tail off and came back up through. So, you know, I, I'd, I'd enjoyed watching Mark, read about him in the Speedsport News, and I thought he was a guy you could hook up with and do really well. And he and I always had that relationship, whether I was the general manager or the, or the crew chief. So when Robin decided to go to, I think, Sabco, uh, he just said, what do you want to do? I said, I'll just do it. And it worked out. It worked out fine. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say it did work out fine. I'd say so. <laughs> 1993, you win four straight. Yeah. Cup races at Watkins Glen, Michigan, Bristol, and Darlington. Those are four very, very different racetracks. And during that same basic time frame, you win five straight bush starts. Yeah. Oh, what did you find that nobody else had? Oh, statue that? limit. Down, statue down, limitation. Down, a lot. <laughs> a lot of downforce. We had. There was no nose height rule. And the lower you got the nose, the more hood angle you put in it, and you can make a ton of front downforce, which was very good because you can make all, basically all you wanted with the rear spoiler, mm -hmm. which is still a third of what they're making today, which I think is one of the reasons the racing isn't as good. Yeah. But anyway, that, yeah. that's for another time. We got the hood at such an angle that Jack had to machine the distributor housings to get the distributor from hitting the hood. And the other thing was is... Uh, if you'll notice the Win Dixie car throughout its life with Mark driving it, it's about momentum with Mark Martin. I mean, if he starts winning pretty soon, like his dear departed dad, Julian Martin, would say, he's 10 feet tall with a machine gun under each arm. <laughs> and, and that's how Mark was. Yeah. So the more we went, the easier it got for Mark to know he's going to climb in that window and win the race. You have a flat tire early, didn't bother Mark. You know, you. N nothing but hey we got a plug wire off no problem i'll pit we'll come back up through there you, you know it's just yeah. he, he just he just, it's mark mark's incredibly talented you can tell by all the iraq championships and he can go anywhere and run fast and that's what he was doing that year i think we actually won we even won phoenix that fall i think we won five races that yeah. year yeah and then we went on to win three Watkins glens in a row and you know, a couple of times we were beaten. One time, I, I know Wally was good, and Wally had a problem, and we still got around him. And, you know, it was Mark, when you, if you go to certain places with Mark, and he's super confident, and you're going to win races. Yeah. When I covered the Bush Series, I actually had a Mark Martin Bush Series template. Mark Martin won today's race by yeah. dot, 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 seconds <laughs> and led dot, 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 yeah. laps. <laughs> oh, gosh, you know. That way it made it just, it, it made it easier to, to ride it after the race. It drove people crazy. You know? <laughs> it, it's like, you just say, it's Mark. Man. I, I remember Bob Labonte swearing he had found out that uh, we had a carbon fiber roof on that car <laughs> and i said bob we actually farmed the bodies out on the winn dixie cars i mean everybody would know if if he had it but it, it was it was a lot of mark well 96 was your last year i think what did it feel like to walk away from that situation particularly with all the success you had oh i hated it huh. yeah I, I can tell you where i was sitting when jack and mark came in and told me what was going to happen yeah I, I, it broke my heart huh. yeah all the things we had done together and I remember, I remember Mark saying, Steve, it's not going to change you and my relationship a bit. I still want you to talk to me on the radio. I said, yeah, okay, I guess, you know, but it just, I hate it. Now, and it needs to be said right up front that Jimmy Finnig is a fantastic person and a great racer. He's proved yeah, it a yeah, thousand yeah. times. 
Mark and he had a relationship from running in, in uh, up north out of Milwaukee with the ASA car. So Mark had confidence in him. Uh, I, it was never explained to me. They just said, here's, Jack just said, here's what we're going to do. And Mark just said, hey, man, it's not going to change anything. So I did continue to talk to him on the radio. We won Sears Point. Jimmy made the call on not pitting at the end and won the race, you know, to his credit. And Jimmy, Jimmy did a fantastic job. But I, Jack wanted me to be more like a general manager or something. But I think he was thinking about maybe building a truck team there, which he ultimately built with Max yeah. Jones up in uh, Michigan. But I, I, I don't know. I don't know whether Jack thought that he had run through me uh, or Jack thought he could use me for other things. But I do know... It was, it was Gap and Roush. Wayne Gap knew a lot about drag racing. Next thing you know, it's just Roush. It was Charlie Selix, who knew a lot about road racing. Protofab, Roush Protofab. Next thing you know, it's just Jack Roush. It was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was, it was, yeah, and they, they had both told me that. They said, when, when you've spilled everything out of your brain, you probably won't be worth much. And... That's how I feel about it. And, and someone should ask Jack that if, if he's interested, but he may not have done that. But again, going back to the first year, we were both kind of looking at each other going, man, you know. <laughs> I can understand yeah. that. Yeah. 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 So you do wind up moving over to Dell Earnhardt Incorporated in 1999. That was a pretty big move. Not only are you changing teams, you're changing manufacturers, yeah. the whole nine yards. Yeah. What went into that decision? Uh, we were at Watkins Glen one year, and I said something. Just a group of people in Earnhardt was there. He said, Neil, you just need to come over and take care of my kid. And I had seen Dale drive late mile stocks, and I didn't think there was much to take care of. He, you know, Really? He, yeah, he, he wasn't <laughs> fast. I was super yeah. surprised at how yeah. well he was already doing in 98 on his way to a championship. Right, yeah. Like, I was tickled when he won Watkins Glen because, like, man, this kid's going to be a race car driver, he, yeah. you know. And... uh yeah, I, I was I was wrong about. I, I guess you can't judge a guy off his late model stock racing. Which, once I got to know Dale better in the situation, Dale didn't help. I mean, Dale probably held him back more than he helped him at that yeah. point in their careers, you know. But uh, yeah, well, I needed a job. You, you know, uh, I'm trying to think where it was. After New Hampshire in '98, Jack came in and come to town on Tuesdays, and I knew it was coming. He said, "Man, I gotta let you go." I said, "I understand, man." He's a, you know, he's basically a school teacher, yeah. you know, he's, and he's a very smart person. He imparts a lot of knowledge into you, takes his time and shows you things. He said, you're the worst student I ever had. And that didn't hurt because I knew I was because I didn't always buy in. Right. He, he, you know, some people bought in and really sucked up and I was just going to be me, you know, and if yeah. I thought something was messed up or if, thought, if I heard Bud Moore had 400 jets in his car, but here, I would bring it up, not to say that you're messed up, but say that maybe there's more to it, you know. So, okay, and, and uh, on down the road we went, and uh, see, Mark had already gone to Charlotte with Jimmy. So there was kind of a skeleton deal going on up there. I guess we had LePage and Johnny Benson. Yeah. Mm. And uh, it just wasn't going well. And we could tell we were just outliers at that time. So eventually when I left... The next year, I think he moved everything down there. But anyway, uh, I, I don't really know what the reason was, but I need a job. I mean, I got a wife and kids, you know. And Earnhardt had talked to me a couple times, talked to me at Daytona. Man, you got to come see my new shop. This thing's been Earn And Jack's standing right there. You, you know, Earnhardt knew what he was doing, you know. So I called. Yeah. And I said, man, I guess it's time to come do this. And he said, all right, come on down here. And that's what we did. And that was a, that was a difficult situation. Yeah. I you can't know? imagine being part of that team. In 2001, what do you remember about those few months? Uh, you know, and the, and the status, the attitude of the team afterwards. Well, I remember going to, I remember practicing it. I think I was spotting for Michael, or at least talking with Michael. He had his own crew chief and all, and they were doing well. And Michael came on the radio and said, I just found something. At Daytona? I mean, you, you know, but he did. And to this day, Michael's a fantastic plate racer. And I thought, well, okay, so we went up there and, and won the race. 
and I mean, super excited for people like Buffy and all these guys yeah. that had worked so hard. Oh, you know, yeah. And Ron, Ron yeah. Warner Day was an absolute stud race car driver, and Michael had to go in there and take his place. And why did Michael take his place? Because Earnhardt liked him. I mean, I, I remember Ron Horner Day driving out as I was driving in at the shop, and Horner had tears in his eyes. I said, what's going on? He said, I just got fired. I said, now just wait a minute. And I went inside, saw Dale, and, you know, I wasn't really at Dale's level or anything like that. But he said, just shut up. He said, I know what I'm doing. And we went to Daytona, and sure enough, he knew what he was doing. So we go to Victory Lane, and here comes Schrader. I thought, well, Schrader and Mikey, you know, he always called him Mikey. And I said, he's going to congratulate him. He grabs him like this and talks to him. And Michael just, I mean, all the euphoria drained out of him. I mean, like that. Well, obviously, Kenny had seen the condition that Dale was in, and it was horrible. So we're like, oh, gosh. So Steve Peterson came and got me. He said, you have got to help us find Dale Jr. We've got to get him to the hospital. So I left Victor Lane. I was already out of Victor Lane walking down pit road when, when Steve got me and found Junior and uh, he went over to the hospital and it's a done deal we're tearing down engines and you know we knew what was going on before Mike made the announcement Dale came and got us and Dale, Dale Junior actually came and got us and took us in his, to his motorhome and uh, he said my dad's getting his first look at heaven hmm. I didn't know that Ah. Uh, Oh, boy. <laughs> it's hard to say. I mean, I'm chilled up here, you, you know. And I don't say that trying to tell somebody a secret. I say that out of respect for Dale Earnhardt Jr., who marched on. Uh, not a lot of people in his position would have done that. A lot of people in the company couldn't do that. So NASCAR came over and said, you're through tearing down. Get out of here. It's because we were tearing down two cars, you know. And that was all the way to the crankshaft. And, uh, but they had already checked everything. But, yeah. You know, they said, just get out of here as quick as you can. Yes, sir. So we loaded our stuff and got out and got in the airplane. And uh, it was uh, three Delta Echo that I was flying in. And uh, they said, just pull out. You know, the line was 50 airplanes long at that time, you know. And they said, just go to, go to this taxiway, go to this taxiway, go to the end of the runway. Tell us when you're ready to go. So they, I mean, they just got us out of there. And we all just went home like in a daze. You know, we, went, we just went to bed like, you know, like anything. Your house burns to the ground, or your kid dies, or whatever happens. You, you, you know, you, you don't really want to take that one in. We woke up the next morning, it's like, man, this was real. And what was a real wake up was when you got to the shop the next morning. The mm. flowers and the wreaths and yeah. the people and yeah. the banners and the cardboard signs, you know, it just is unbelievable. And what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Like, we're going to do. The good thing about NASCAR racing is you live by a schedule. They won't hold it up for you if you're not ready, and they're, and they're not, not going to do yeah. it early and sneak it by you. So your whole life is compartmentalized right. like it was at Petty Enterprises 50 years ago, and it, that was always a comfort to me. So we had racing. And then uh, do we go to Rockingham next? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Jeez. Yeah, everybody was holding up the three. and We won with Park. At yeah, Rockingham. Rockingham. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Sure did. Yeah, that was pretty unreal. And then and then it got it was okay for a year or two, but there wasn't when they came to put helicopter or when they came with helicopters to put air conditioning units on top of Dale Jr.'s new shop at DEI, Earnhardt was up on the roof directing them. When the when the the big horses that Budweiser came to town on a, with on a truck that they gave to Earnhardt, Earnhardt told them how to feed them. When the fence was being built, Earnhardt was welding the fence up. Y you know what I mean? I see your point. I see your point. You know, I, I remember one time we showed up at the airport and I got a group going to Daytona for winter testing and Paul Andrews has a group going to Atlanta to the Lockheed Wind Tunnel. And I said, what plane are you taking? The King Air. I said, but we're taking the King Air. Yeah, can't do that. So... So we kind of worked it out where we took a skeleton crew and dropped them off in Atlanta and then went to Daytona and came back and got the rest of them, okay? So that's not the real story. The, when we got back, and we were gone two or three days, when we got back, Earnhardt, mail, yeah, come over here to my office. Okay, so I go over there, it's me, Tony Uri, because the eight cars who I was going with, Paul Andrews, a couple other guys. 
yeah, this, and here's what we're going to do. Here's how this is going to work out. That's going to. He said, but let me tell you something, Mill, right here in front of these guys so they know. You don't ever change a schedule on my airplane. Those are my airplanes. Those are not your airplanes. Hmm. You're not me. So don't, don't even open your mouth in the office at the airport. I said, yes, sir, man, I'm sorry, but I was just trying to get everybody where they needed to go. I don't care. It's my airplane. Meal, okay, you guys, get out of here. Like, when you just get out of here. I, I turn, he goes, Meal, you stay here. You sit down right there. I said, well, I'm going to get another chewing. <laughs> so I'm like, yes, sir. I said, and he goes, hey, the way you did that airplane thing was perfect. We got everybody where they needed to get. He said, but. I got to show them on the balls. I said, yes, sir, buddy. I, I'm with you. As long as I know it's a con, I'm good. And that, that's the biggest single thing I remember about Dale Earnhardt was he was a bad son of a gun, but, it, but he would come back and buy an ice cream cone, you know. At what point did you decide to step away from NASCAR? When Chip Ganassi fired me. Well, that would I would do love it. to still be there. Yeah, <laughs> I, I miss it, it every day. Yeah. Okay. But what happened is my son Shane got hurt real bad at Terre Haute. And uh, he had a basically a – to get all he could get, he has, only has one hand that works, but to even get to that was three years in a place called the Shepherd Center in Atlanta. The first year when I was still working for Chip, you know, we won, won two of the biggest races and four races, races all together in 2010. We're rolling. I mean, Chip is loving it. We're building our own cars. This is fantastic. So the next year we get engines from RCR, which was a little bit problematic, but it was okay, and we were horrible. Well, the biggest reason we were horrible, I don't want to paint myself as being the linchpin of the whole place, but I felt like I let the company down because when my kid was injured like that and he was going through this therapy and I needed to be in Atlanta a day a week or so with my wife and him, there's no way I had the right amount of focus. But at the time, I didn't realize it. We just ran horribly. I think we were 21st and 24th in points. Broke a lot of, didn't explode engines, but broke a water pump and broke a fitting. But, but I, uh, other than that, we, we also didn't run good until they did break. So it was my fault. I'm, I'm the guy that's in charge. You know, I'm a guy that they were happy about when we won four races the year before, including Daytona in the Brickyard. And Juan won a race, which was fantastic because yeah. he had threatened so many times at the Brickyard and New Hampshire. And, you know, so, it was, you know, it was a great year. 2011 was a nightmare. And that's because I wasn't aware. I wasn't doing a good job of fixing things because my mind was in Atlanta. You know, I, I messed that up. I deserved to get fired. I really did. I did a really, really poor job. And I, I knew I was 58 years old and probably couldn't get a job. And I wasn't a degreed engineer, but maybe I'd get something going on. And I went to Daytona in 12 and talked to some people, but nobody had any interest. And nobody's ever called since. <laughs> Steve, you've mentioned Shane. Yes, sir. And you experienced so many things in racing. Yeah. But you went through things with Shane that, yes, sir. that no person should ever have to deal with. What did you learn from that experience, and what are you still learning? You, you go through exactly what they say you're going to go through. You, you know, I can remember tearing pictures off the wall. I was so mad at the world and God and anybody who had any involvement in this. And then, but I went for a. You know, I, I remember Lauren talking to Lauren Rainier. Yeah, he, Shane was hurt in October of of ten, and I remember being. In, Lauren Rainier's office, and he said, man, how's Shane doing? This is like the next, following January. I said, well, he's good. They're going to teach him. He's going to get better. He's got his, he had his thumb moving at that time. That yeah. was it. And he could stand up without passing out, which is a really big thing. And I said, yeah. He said, well, what do you look for? I said, oh, man, I just hope they get him where he's standing up and moving around a little bit by the Hoosier 100 because I really he had won the year before. I really want to take him back there and him be proud of himself. That's insane. He's got a C4 to C7. I mean, he's yeah. lucky to have a hand. He's lucky. The, when he first came to CMC in Charlotte, they, he was on a ventilator. They said, just take him home. He'll never even breathe on his own. Just take him home. He, wow. I said, no, no, let's, you know, Felix had some influence at that hospital and got him right in. I said, no, 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 let's do this. And at that time, his brain injury was so bad, he would howl like a coyote when the sun went down. I mean, that's how bad his brain was. And, and, and I'm like, you know, two months later, well, we'll just, you know, we'll go to the Hoosier 100 and see what's up. And I, I told the doctor the morning after, he said, you know, we've got to put 18-inch rods in his neck because his back is broken so badly. His spinal cord's hurt real bad. Okay. I said, now, 
they were IndyCar was talking to him about running these Indy Lights cars. I said, so make sure it doesn't prevent him from being in a semi-laid down position. And the doctor looked at me like I was nuts. And I didn't have, I didn't have a clue. I was in such denial that it was unreasonable. So, you know, in in the unfortunately, other p children have been hurt, and kids have been hurt, and men have been hurt. And anybody I know, I say, hey, look, man, you're going to go through a lot of things. One is you're not going to believe them. Then you're going to be mad at them. Then you're going to be mad at yourself. And then you're going to be mad at God, and then eventually you just kind of work your way through it, I guess. You know, I t Kyle Petty talked to me, and he said, man, I cry every day for Adam. He said, it's not going to get better till you're dead. I said, yeah, yeah, I know, man. I, I know that, but he, that ain't going to happen to me. You yeah, know, yeah, I mean, yeah. not, not, I'm, I'm one tough son of a gun, and, and I still struggle with it every day. That's I the bet. biggest thing I learned is you don't get over it. Now, what are you doing today? Yeah. I work for a company in uh, Greensboro as a— uh, prototype builder we build um, stealth vehicles that can find uh, radiation anthrax ebola wow they have they oh, have uh, uh, all kind all kinds of uh, bomb making materials uh, it has a, a system that pulls air into it and then it goes through these instruments and it'll pop up on a screen we also have uh, the most advanced in the world uh, facial recognition yeah, so, so, and they go Holy predominantly, we, we, they don't sell them to China because they're going to copy them, but they're all over the Middle East. Uh, TSA uh, has them. Uh, they look like a bread truck or whatever they want it to look like, a laundry truck, and they'll park them outside a ball field, and everybody that prays by gets their eye checked or their face checked, and it'll pop up if they're a bad guy. There's a drone that flies off it, and they can find Holy the bad guys cow. in the stadium where they're sitting just to keep an eye on them. The bomb-making stuff is incredible. Uh, dr drugs, cocaine. Now, we're not going to get shot for— No, no, no. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. Sure, this is not the CIA. Uh, well, they're in, they, they, they I bet. have vehicles. He can't say. Yeah, no. we, we can't say. But it's very interesting. I, I would be bored with the production— but I really enjoy the prototype work. It's fun because somebody says, could you, you thinking about this? Oh, yeah. So you get to machine a little something to make a bracket. And, you know, it's like building the coolest race car in the world. But the deadlines are so much further out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, we grew up and we were testing the first week in December at Daytona and Christmas is off. And then first week of January and, you know, you got to go, 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 barely making it. You know, but in this bit, in, in the real world, I have found out that you can push a deadline back a little bit. And that's something of a relief. So what kind of vehicles are these? You mentioned the bread truck, but I, I kind of envision tanks and no, you know, no nothing with, <laughs> stuff no like armament. that. No really? armament. Okay. Yeah, no armament. Uh, there's a uh, hospital that involves uh, 24 trailers that are all hooked together. Yeah. And uh, they go to uh, a lot of places in the Middle East because where the people are getting hurt is so far from the city. You know, in Vietnam, they could throw them in a helicopter, and 10 minutes later, they're, yeah. they're, in, they're getting looked at. Well... They're dying before they can get to the hospital. So we built these hospitals. Like I said, it's 27 or 24 tractor trailers, and they can do everything. I mean, they operate right there. They do, they do everything, you know. And, and there's things you have to think about that you wouldn't normally think about. What do you do with body parts? What, do you, what about the blood? You know, what about any fluid? You know what I mean? So you're like, oh, wow, I never thought about that. We've got to build another trailer to take care of all that stuff. You, you yeah. know, I mean, one trailer's a morgue. You know, oh, I mean, wow. it's just like, man, I would have never thought of that, you know, but... Yeah, but that's the kind of stuff we do. Yeah. I am flabby. I <laughs> There's a lot out there that we You've learned something about. from the podcast. <laughs> Steve Mills, 007. <laughs> yeah. 